Um, yeah, hi, I'm Sophie. I uh, am leading IAC crypto at uh, Google. Um, my background is in algebraic geometry, so if you look at my PhD thesis, there will be no cryptography. The only, the only lattices that you find there are p-adic, and so far nobody has invented a crypto system on p-adic lattices, but who knows? Uh, yeah, I lead uh, the ISE crypto team. ISE is the general application security team at Google. ISE crypto does the cryptography within that. And as such, it's sort of our job is sort of vaguely all of cryptography at Google, um, keeping the security posture of the company uh, where we want it. And uh, uh, as part of that, also uh, looking into post-quantum cryptography. Um, I split this talk into uh, roughly three sections. Um, first, I'm going to revisit the sweat model for uh, PQC and look at how it like applies in practice and what kind of caveats uh, we might see in the industry. Um, then I will give a quick overview of a case stu study that we did, or a thing that we did, where we um, had our internal encryption in transit um, and added uh, quantum, uh, safe, uh, quantum safe cipher suites to that. Um, and lastly, I uh, want to talk a bit about how we, in general, think about um, things like standards, primitives, especially when it comes to signatures. Uh, so I hope there's like both something in this talk that is a bit backward looking, a bit forward looking, and uh, like in particular talking a bit more about like how we um, see post quantum uh, in the industry. Okay, um, first uh, for sweat modeling. Um, I think in cryptography we sometimes skip over the sweat model a bit too quickly and just assume that everyone is infinitely powerful. Um, but uh, let's look at it uh, a bit more concretely. Like, I think the thing that anybody uh, here knows is the um, store now, decrypt later attack of like, if someone gets a hold of a ciphertext they're interested now and stores that for a while and then they develop a quantum computer, then uh, they will be able to uh, uh, decrypt that at that later point in time. That already implies that this person that is attacking us here is like fairly sophisticated because otherwise they wouldn't be storing all these ciphertexts uh, in the hopes of doing something to them later. Uh, but like, can we go beyond this threat model that like only employ uh, only applies to to very specific encryption scenarios? Um, so for that, I wanted to look at cryptography in sort of uh, um, four different uh, main categories of like asymmetric encryption, digital signatures, symmetric cryptography, and everything else that I like to call fancy cryptography um, that like has uh, like various amounts of, of uses. Okay, um, so I kind of already uh, touched on the asymmetric encryption. Um, this is obviously vulnerable to store now decrypt later. If I have uh, a cipher text and I wait for however long it takes for, for me to build a quantum computer, I can decrypt a quantum computer using Shor's algorithm probably not even that hard um, once you have that quantum computer. Um, there is, uh, however, like something that makes this situation a little bit better than that makes it sound. Like, it's clearly urgent that we do something about asymmetric encryption, but on the other hand, there's also relatively few protocols and uh, tech stacks that are actually employed here. Like, Asymmetric encryption is mostly concentrated of, uh, on encryption in transit. Encryption in transit, that's mostly TLS, mostly SSH. And if you fix like these few protocols and their related libraries, uh, you are already fairly um, well established in getting your quantum safety on. On top of that, um, in encryption in transit, you usually don't really care about what was transmitted yesterday, so things are fairly ephemeral 
and you can um, switch Cypher suites fairly painlessly. So that is sort of the good news about uh, asymmetric encryption where, yes, we need to act soon because uh, store now decrypt later, but on the other hand, the migration is fairly painless, all things considered. These things are all very, very painful. Asymmetric encryption is probably the least. Signatures, on the other hand, are not quite the same story. I kind of tried to uh, visualize that here by showing that there's a lot of them. Um, signatures are used everywhere. Like everything, every piece of uh, application will need to sign something somewhere to like, uh, it wants to like uh, um, download information from, from a web service or something and so on. There's a lot of application level um, cryptography that uses signatures. And that makes signatures a bit of a nightmare. Uh, on top of that, signatures are also much longer lived. Um, usually, the whole point of a signature is that I give you the public key, and then sometime later, I give you something that I sign with it. Uh, if I can already say what I sign with it, I can just give you a hash of the thing that I want to sign. I don't need to uh, go through the efforts of having a, a signature scheme. So signature schemes are longer lived, and they are far more distributed in far more stacks and so on. So um, while they're nowhere near as urgent as encryption in transit is, uh, they are very, very important that we start with this transition as soon as possible because we are kind of running uh, open eyes into a nightmare scenario where we will have like, okay, we fixed, uh, I don't know, the web PKI stack, but that leaves still a very, very long tail open for signatures. That is the thing that I'm very worried with signatures that we really need to work on these things much sooner than the, the naive threat model that just focuses on uh, store now decrypt later suggests. Next, we have symmetric cryptography. Uh, where the PDF printing uh, swallowed part of my slides. Uh, there used to be little shields on all of these to, to signify that, um, yeah, symmetric cryptography is very widespread, even more widespread than uh, uh, digital signatures. Like any kind of stateless, restful server architecture pretty much gets to this restful statelessness by encrypting their state putting it in a cookie and sending it to, to the client uh, so that later it can recover that state from that cookie and it doesn't matter which server gets this, uh, this encrypted blob. So symmetric cryptography is everywhere. Uh, but the good news here is that unless we believe that Grover's attack has any legs, which I don't really think that it is very uh, um, dangerous, uh, we are not really in any hurry of mitigating it, even if it's like AS 128-bit. Uh, this seems to be uh, very much uh, uh, very down on the list of our threat riddle, which is good because it would be an even worse nightmare than, than we already have with signatures if we also had to deal with uh, all of our symmetric cryptography. Um, lastly, the fancy cryptography. Uh, the good news there is that there isn't that much use of these other schemes. The bad news there is where there is use of these other schemes like private set intersection and so on, it usually is um, elliptic curve based, pairing based and so on. It's always somewhat jarring to like go to a cryptography conference and first hear a bunch of talks about PQC and then hear a bunch of talks about uh, what great group signature scheme uh, someone came up with next using uh, pairings. Uh, it would be very nice if we uh, like got to a place where we had more of these schemes actually based on things like learning with errors and so on. Like, I've seen there's a bunch of talks uh, in this conference that already makes us better, but I think there's still a lot more research needed to actually fill that gap. Okay. Um, that was uh, my main section on uh, uh, the threat modeling of, um, of PQC. So to sort of summarize a bit, uh, 
we need to focus on encryption in transit because it's urgent, um, but we can do, uh, we can fix that fairly, fairly easily. Um, we need to focus on signatures in a much more broad perspective and especially work with a lot of like standard um, bodies and so on to ensure that signature schemes get to a quantum safe state before the time runs out, um, and that might be a much bigger nightmare than, um, than the encryption in transit uh, turns out to be. Um, and yeah, otherwise, more, more of these privacy-preserving uh, schemes uh, on PQC would be nice. Um, so, the next part of the talk is about uh, ALTS. Uh, so I should first explain what ALTS is. Uh, ALTS is our uh, internal encryption in transit um, protocol. Um, the reason why Google has its own encryption in transit protocol are mostly historic. Like, it was like a long time ago uh, that we started, and at that point in time, uh, TLS was just not uh, there yet, not really possible to use for, for this use case. So we wrote our own. Um, there's still some things where um, it is uh, um, still not easy to replace with TLS even right now in that it is highly optimized for high performance workloads. Like Google has a lot of very, very high uh, QPS um, workloads. So uh, we kind of need to have some ways of doing encryption in transit that is uh, very fast and like cuts out a lot of the uh, um, like unnecessary uh, bits of it. Um, so let's look at the protocol a bit. Um, it is fairly straightforward. It is uh, like just a fairly straightforward uh, static static key exchange. It comes in sort of two flavors. I will focus mostly on the on the static static uh, flavor. Um, there's this flavor, uh, the static static, which is the high performance flavor that is like uh, uh, sacrificing for its secrecy in order to get uh, a much higher performance. And then there's another flavor of it that then uses 3 dh to, to be for its secret and all that good stuff. Um, so how does it work? Um, well, it starts with the client sending a message uh, that they want to initialize a connection where they send their static key and a certificate for that key. So important difference to TLS is that the thing that is signed is a key share and not, um, not like a signing key. Um, the server responds to that with their own static key and a certificate for that key and uh, already can at this point uh, send um, a secret confirmation uh, where they hash the previous interaction, uh, put it together with a constant, make it together with, um, with a shared secret, and uh, that way the client can now check that they are talking to the same, uh, in the same context and they're sharing actually the same shared secret. Um, after the client uh, receives both this server init and server finished message, uh, they will uh, uh, respond with the, with the same secret confirmation. And with that, we know that we are in the same context. We have the same shared secret. We can use that shared secret together with all of the other uh, context to um, derive uh, uh, further keys. And uh, the handshake is complete. Um, so I said that this is a very high performance optimized um, protocol. So uh, like unsurprisingly enough, there is also a second flow of this protocol that deals with resumption. Um, in this case, if the client has a resumption ticket, which is just an encrypted um, uh, uh, secret that was uh, derived at a previous session, um, they will send that uh, ticket along with the client in it, and the server can then just say, yeah, I uh, was able to decrypt this, and uh, can continue from there. Um, the nice thing is uh, that if you look at this flow, 
there's not a single asymmetric uh, cryptographic operation that happens in these cases. Um, the static ECDH key is static, so nothing to do there. Um, the certificate doesn't need to be validated because I, I have the resumption ticket. Uh, so the only thing that happens here is, um, uh, uh, is symmetric cryptography because this is basically a pre-shared uh, secret handshake, uh, which makes this extremely fast. Um, the, this obviously doesn't give you any forward secrecy. We kind of try to get around that by rotating these keys extremely frequently uh, so that uh, like all of these things will get invalidated uh, relatively frequency so, so that we force new handshakes uh, and have less exposure to post compromise uh, traffic decryption. Um, so this is uh, the protocol and now let's look at what we are about to do to this. So this is uh, a sketch of what the current overhead looks like. So we have some protocol overhead, we have some X25519 key share, um, we have some certificate information. I think this is too few. This is an ECDSA signature, and instead it's an RSA signature, but like it's just uh, a few more lines, like it's four lines instead of one. Um, this is what this uh, looks like. So it is definitely very low overhead. Like it is, uh, you can see how this is really designed to be uh, as fast as possible, as lean as possible, cutting out pretty much anything that isn't necessary for the security. And now let's add uh, a PQC scheme to that. This is an HRSS public key in comparison, um, or the ciphertext as well, they are the same size for HRSS. Um, why is it HRSS and not Kyber? Um, has nothing to do with uh, Google's preferences in the schemes. This is just because we started this a long time ago, uh, like several years ago, and we had uh, lying around from like, I think 2018 when uh, Chrome did this experiment with uh, Cloudflare of um, PQTLS, and they used HRSS long before Kyber was selected. So this is not trying to, uh, uh, be an affront to NIST. This is just, this was the implementation that we had at the time when we started this project, uh, and it was before NIST selected Kaiba. Um, so it definitely is uh, making this low overhead um, a little bit less low overhead. Um, that turned out to be mostly okay. Um, there were like two problems, like, one team had, a, had an issue that they uh, kind of expected this to be less than a kilobyte in size, and there isn't really any way to have a PQC handshake that is less than a kilobyte, but they were able to fix that. The other problem that we went into is that we stored some things on the stack, and in some machines, it turns out that the stack couldn't hold that many bytes. And so we had a kind of literal stack overflow of the thing that we put on the stack was too big. Um, but that was easy fixed, like you just put it on the heap instead, and uh, then we were able to uh, continue rolling things out. Um, so what do you do when you, have, uh, when you want to uh, uh, do PQC? The easiest thing to do is you just, like, we don't really care about um, quantum authenticity. Like, I think that there is no man in the middle with a quantum computer right now, at least I hope so. Um, in any case, if there's one, then we are unfortunately vulnerable to them. Uh, so the easiest thing to do, you don't want to mess with the protocol as much as possible because, yeah, it's, uh, uh, these protocols are sensitive, so you want to, as much as possible, just from the classic perspective, have some random data writing uh, along for, for, the, uh, for, for everything. So you add an ephemeral PQC public key, and uh, the server will just, uh, uh, encapsulate to that public key, and so that is what we did. Um, you can maybe already see where this is going because I set it up uh, emphasizing on how much this is like built for performance. Um, even before we were done with rolling anything out, uh, as the first clients had uh, this thing, but the server wasn't even responding, uh, it wasn't even selecting the cipher suite, uh, we got people uh, uh, saying that things are too slow. 
Um, the reason for that is that you now have an ephemeral key gen uh, where previously there was no operation at all. So the first thing that we needed to do was to cache that key for 10 minutes. Um, turns out that forward secrecy uh, was not to be. Um, and uh, um, with that cache, uh, at least if the server doesn't do any PQC, the client uh, kind of amortizes uh, any of the, the work it has to do uh, over, uh, um, the, uh, uh, over the handshakes, and so it doesn't really care that it sometimes has to generate a, a public key. Uh, most of the time it doesn't. Um, the problem is now, uh, while the client is happy now, at least on client in it, uh, server in it, and uh, um, the client decapsulating, still at an asymmetric operation, um, which for the full handshake doesn't matter, because for the full handshake, HRSS is order of magnitude about the same as elliptic curve, so that isn't really all that noticeable. But uh, remember when I said that like our, the resumption handshake would have no asymmetric op operations, well, now it does. And uh, it turns out that we did this whole thing of like not having forward secrecy and rotating our keys very frequently for a reason. Um, and uh, teams complained that uh, their latency was uh, not uh, uh, tolerable and that we needed to change this. And uh, so we needed to um, like make sure that on resumption uh, we don't um, uh, uh, slow things down more. Um, that is relatively straightforward to fix as well. Like, uh, uh, the resumption secret is derived from a session secret that already had quantum um, safety, or ha already was like derived via quantum safe uh, protocols. So you can just not do the PQC parts on resumed sessions. Um, and that's exactly what we did. Uh, like for resumed sessions, we would just not do this, uh, um, uh, not do this handshake and um, just be happy with the fact that uh, we already use a secret that was uh, negotiated via a full handshake that had uh, quantum security. So um, with all of this uh, together, we now have a scheme that um, is quantum safe, um, at least for uh, a store now decrypt later attack. It's not safe against um, um, uh, an attacker with, with an, uh, as against an active attacker with a quantum computer. Um, the, uh, um, the thing to note here is that I'm like compressing the timelines a bit. Uh, this happened over, I think, three years. I think we started in 2020 uh, with, with the first drafts of how to do this. Um, it took us a while uh, to actually roll this out because of like various things that happened along the way. And the one thing to keep in mind is that this is the absolute best case scenario for uh, a migration of these things. This is a tech stack that we fully own, uh, run on computers that we fully own, um, and uh, uh, doing things in a very restricted uh, setting with only ephemeral parameters. Um, so this is kind of a taste of how difficult this can be and how many things there are that in hindsight seem obvious, like you probably shouldn't add uh, asymmetric cryptography to something that was specifically designed to not uh, have to do asymmetric cryptography, uh, but at the same time uh, are much less obvious than like, yeah, it's when you're doing it. And so uh, this is like, kind of a bit of a warning for uh, the future as well that like this migration will take quite some time and will be quite painful. Um, there is like a, a, a nice story that I like to, to say to also uh, underscore that a bit is that like elliptic curves are about the same age that I am. They were proposed in, in 85. 
Um, and uh, the first use of elliptic curves was, I think, in 2011. And there are still a lot of cases where RSA is used currently where elliptic curves would be arguably the better choice. Uh, so these transitions can take a very, very long time. I hope that the quantum, uh, uh, post-quantum transition will be a bit faster than that. But um, yeah, we will need to uh, be very careful with that and need to start on that soon, especially when it comes to, to these signature schemes as well, because yeah, like, as I said, there's a lot more difficulty around signature schemes uh, than there is in encryption in transit, and this already had enough difficulty there uh, trying to roll things out without disrupting things too much. Obviously, you can speed ahead these timelines if there is, like, an imminent danger and, like, roll things out much more quickly, but you really don't want to do that for something where you said, well, yeah, I'm scared of this theoretical computing machine that might exist in the future. So you need to find a way of like doing this migration without upsetting too many product teams. Okay. Um, so this was uh, uh, like look into the past of what we've done there. Uh, now the last part of the talk, I wanted to spend a bit talking about how we think about um, standards, uh, how we think about primitives, and sort of more for like things that um, like can be used as uh, uh, where, where things went wrong previously, things that we would like to see in standards and so on, from like both the implementer perspective and the perspective of someone who has to try to get like 100,000 people or more to actually use these things in a way as well. Um, so first let's look at uh, the kind of worst case scenario. Um, for those of you who are lucky enough to not know what JWT is, um, JWT is a token format uh, that uses signature schemes to produce tokens. I don't know why they can't just sign whatever they wanted to sign, but it is a format. Um, it has an RFC standard, and kind of built into that standard is um, a problem in that this token format specifies a field called ALK um, that um, kind of in the token says which algorithm this token is using. Um, and on top of that, it also has um, an algorithm called none, which is exactly what it sounds like. So uh, if you have a kind of naive implementation of this a JWT RFC or a naive usage of a JWT library, you very well might end up in a situation where uh, the way to get into a system is by taking a token, ripping out the signature, putting whatever you want uh, in it, and then say, uh, oh, by the way, just accept it. This is fine. Um, um, the algorithm for verifying the signature should just be true. Um, so this is kind of the, the worst case scenario, so the, what you can see with a standard. I don't think it's very useful to blame the developers on this. Uh, the developers are just reading a standard and implementing it. Uh, I don't even think it's very useful to blame like library developers for that. Um, it's, it's, sort of try, it's sort of guiding you into this trap. Um, I think where we need to fix these things is as far up as possible. Like we should make sure that our standards don't allow for these like garden pass uh, options where you end up, uh, 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 like if you go the naive pass, you end up with a vulnerability. Um, this is a website that counts the days since the last of such vulnerabilities, and I think that counter rarely ever goes uh, above 300 days or so. Um, okay, so um, the one way that uh, we try to think about how we avoid this kind of problem uh, that I kind of put as this guiding principle that isn't quite a mathematical statement, but also is fairly formal, um, is 
like saying that a cryptographic key should be a full description of an algorithm. There shouldn't be any um, like questions left for defining this uh, algorithm that aren't part of the key. Uh, so a cryptographic key should be a full description of a mass mathematical function. And if you want to evaluate that function, the only thing that you should need are the things that are inputs of that primitive. Um, I have a few examples to try to uh, um, like uh, uh, show that a bit more. Um, in particular, showing how we did that in Tink. Um, for that, I should maybe explain what Tink is. Um, it has a very nice logo. Uh, but other than that, it is our internal application cryptography library that uh, also is open source, so everybody can use it. Um, the attempt behind that library, it doesn't actually do much cryptography. Like, pretty much all cryptography we try to do in Boring SSL, and Tink is sort of sitting in a layer above that. And what Tink does is it handles a lot of the key management, and it handles a lot of the sharper edges of Boring SSL. Like, Boring SSL, like any kind of like low-level cryptographic library, needs to be able to do, uh, let you do things that you might not want to do, uh, might not want to have like just any developer use without having done uh, the bare minimum of research. Like um, one thing that you can imagine is if you are trying to implement an API, uh, the standard thing that anyone does who comes across a new API is they find a function, they call that function with the arguments that they know, and everything else they leave empty. Um, and if it works, then they will probably never revisit that function again. If you do that on a cryptographic library, and that thing that you didn't know what to do about was called IV, then you now have a giant vulnerability sitting in your code, uh, but it looks very encrypted, like, it looks very random, uh, must have worked. So one thing that Tink does, for example, is it doesn't even give you the option of setting an IV. Uh, the IV is just random, and uh, that's it. Uh, you, as a developer, don't get to choose that. There are obviously situations where you need to choose the IV, but then you don't need to use Tink. Uh, so it tries to file down these, sh these sharp edges, and it tries to deal with the key management. And the thing that we are going to talk uh, about right now mostly is going to be this key management. So how does uh, a key look like in Tink? Um, Kind of as I alluded to of being a full description of the algorithm, uh, the key contains like the type of algorithm, ECDSA in this case, and it contains all the parameters that you need for this algorithm. So it tells you it's P256 and you need to use SHA-256 hash function for this, and you cannot use these, this secret material with any other parameter set because it's that parameter set. And then it also contains the raw key material. Um, the other thing that you need to do when you do key management is you usually cannot operate on single keys. Uh, you eventually want to rotate those keys, and if you rotate these keys without there being other keys to, uh, that are already known, um, you have an outage. So key, uh, uh, keys in Tink come in so-called key sets, uh, which is just a set of these keys. Uh, they each have an ID that is unique in the key set, but otherwise meaningless. And one of these keys is marked primary, um, which is the key that we then use for, for actually signing. Um, so how does a, a signature look like then? Um, there's a way of saying, like, just give me a signature without anything, and it will just give you the signature without any uh, additional um, uh, uh, context. But uh, that means that when verifying, it needs to go through all the keys in the key set. So instead, uh, the standard format uh, will look something like this, where first there is um, a version number. I'm not sure if that version number will ever be useful, but it's like better than uh, needing a version number and not having one. Um, then the next four bytes are this key ID. Uh, which is the key that was used to create the signature. This means that when verifying, you can just read that key ID and jump to that specific verification key. 
Um, and then this is followed by the rest of the signature. Uh, for signatures, this works out right. Uh, like, uh, this is a new signature scheme that is still a secure signature scheme. Um, for some other primitives, you need to be more careful. Um, if you do this for, I don't know, AADs, then your battery will run low. Um, uh, no, but if you do this for AADs, then uh, um, you uh, uh, still get an AAD and it's still secure, it still has NCCA2, but it's obviously not indistinguishable from random noise anymore because there's a constant in front. Uh, usually not a big problem. There are other primitives like, I don't know, PRFs that uh, will get, uh, uh, like where you cannot do this prefix method at all because yeah, it's obviously not a random function if it has a constant. Um, so then uh, this is key set. How does a key rotation look like and what are the like reliability wise dangerous parts of a key rotation? Um, they will be important because this is how we get from where we are now to a quantum safe um, a future because we need to basically rotate to the quantum safe scheme. Um, so the first thing that we need to do when rotating keys is deleting the, old, uh, the oldest key in the key set. Um, this can already be a reliability problem um, if there are still signatures that need to be verified on that key set. Um, I'm playing a bit fast and loose here between the public and the private key set. Um, like, let's just assume that they are all tied together in this, case, in this use case for whatever reason. But yeah, if you delete a, a signature key, uh, a verification key that you still want to verify stuff with, things will break because uh, now some signatures that are supposed to be valid are no longer valid. Um, the next thing that you need to do is you need to select a new primary key. Um, you might have noticed that the primary key that I put in this key set is, uh, was on position two. Um, that is for a good reason, because if you um, had uh, the newest key to be the primary key that is being used, uh, then you would run into the problem that any uh, uh, verifier that doesn't have the new key set will not be able to verify with this key that it doesn't know. So the way that you defend against that is by having this uh, new key already be part of the key set, even though it's no, uh, not in use yet. Um, and then you can just promote it to primary and, thank, uh, and hopefully nothing should happen. Um, it depends on how often you rotate and how quickly you are in distributing your verification key sets. Um, if you need more than one key there, then you need to put in more than one key there. Um, the last step is to add a new uh, key. In this case, this is a nice hybrid key that I put in there. Uh, and this key now will not be used for anything for like however long it takes until your next rotation period comes uh, around and you get a new primary key. Uh, this already shows you one problem in like uh, uh, doing things like these migrations. Um, we've done one key, uh, uh, key rotation and uh, there's not a single post-quantum signature. Uh, we do the next key rotation and uh, now the new uh, signatures are post-quantum, but any key in this key set is equally trusted. So there's a ton of old um, keys still around that are, um, that are classical keys, and only at the point where, in this case, we've rotated four times are we actually in a scenario where we are fully quantum safe. And it depends on how long your rotation frequency is. It can very well be like 90 days or so, uh, in case of like uh, PKI, for example. Um, and suddenly you are uh, like talking about a year. If anything goes wrong there and you d discover that you implemented something wrong or so, then you have another year that it takes to, to get all this rolled out and so on and so forth. So this is how um, something like a, a migration like this ends up taking a lot of time because in order to do this in a safe manner that doesn't like brick a bunch of devices, you need to uh, do step by step fairly slowly and like every time check that nothing is broken and so on. So uh, you do easily run into issues 
with that and uh, need to be very careful in how you do this key rotation. Um, this is especially true if you didn't use Tink and didn't use anything that uses a similar method, but like hard-coded that there is one public key. Um, as many application level security things do, uh, in which case uh, adding this new key means now a code change, so now you need to push out a new binary, and so on and so forth. So this can take almost arbitrarily long. Um, yeah, but the thing that you can see here very well is this like sort of a key is like describing everything that it does. Um, so maybe a little bit more concretely, what does that mean for um, something like a NIST standard or so? Um, these extra parameters, you probably don't want to put them in your, in your key itself because uh, uh, that is something that the higher level um, applications will have to deal with. Uh, and in some cases, you need to be very, very compact in your descriptions. Uh, but maybe this principle can still teach us something. So this is kind of how a general uh, signing scheme would usually be portrayed. And so um, you could think of like, okay, we need to define these functions. Um, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that a computer doesn't know what a curly K is or anything like that. So for a computer, the functions look more like this. And when I say that um, this uh, uh, key needs to be a, a, a mathematical function that needs to be defined, um, this is the function that needs to be defined. So we need to have a function that is well-defined on byte strings because that is what the computer operates at. And that means that um, the standard needs to say what happens on edge cases. Like there might be keys that the G will never generate. Like, I don't know, in case of Delisium, for example, there might be some non-reduced uh, parameters in, uh, um, in my public key. The standard needs to tell me what to do in these cases. It cannot uh, say, um, well, um, that's not a public key, so I will not describe what happens here. Uh, it needs to tell, uh, say what happens in these cases because otherwise um, different implementers of a standard will come to different conclusions about that and we will get a huge mess. And that is not just a hypothetical scenario, that is kind of what happened with almost any standard that we have, that we have various small differences in implementations that lead to a huge mess. Um, So to have a bit of a corollary to that, this is an example of um, Whitechip proof, which is a test vector suite. Uh, this is an example for X25519 that I pulled out there. Um, as you can see here, uh, it has this nice result state of acceptable. Because it turns out that even though the X25519 standard tries to be very clear in what is, uh, what is an X25519 key as a byte string, it is not clear enough and it doesn't use must in some places where it really should have used must. And so you are in this situation that this key, because it lies on the twist, can be seen as acceptable, but uh, can, uh, can be seen as valid, but can also be seen as invalid by the implementation. It's up to the implementer to make that choice. And then you end up with this kind of tri-state of test vectors that say um, this test vector, well, it's kind of up to you what you do with that. It's acceptable. Um, so uh, uh, we need to have all of these different uh, edge cases described in the standard, but we also need to make sure that our test vectors actually cover all these uh, edge cases and actually te uh, test the, the failure cases as well um, and tell us which ones are invalid and which ones are valid so that hopefully with the PQC standards we will not have, again, um, a category of acceptable um, uh, uh, standards. Okay, um, one more thing that uh, we can take out of this principle is a point on separability. Um, separability is this notion of like, when I have a hybrid signature, what can I do in order to uh, create, like how can I create a hybrid signature? 
Um, this is the simplest way that you create a, a hybrid signature scheme. If you have two secure uh, signature schemes, uh, then this will produce another cryptographically secure signature scheme uh, by just using the AND operator. But what's important uh, to note here is that uh, it is only a secure uh, signature scheme if you have this G function to be the generator function. So the key that you generate must be a hybrid key. It, it cannot be that you take a classic key that you used in a classic way over here and um, a PQC key that you came up uh, newly but maybe want to switch to exclusively over there and oh, I will just uh, put that uh, there and like look whether both of them are true or maybe one of them is true. That way lies a lot of vulnerabilities in, in protocols with downgrade attacks and whatnot. Uh, whenever we use hybrid signatures, these should be their own, um, should be their own signature scheme. They should be their own cipher suite. Uh, we shouldn't have like trying to solve this on the protocol level because there are too many protocols and um, it's too easy to have some some issues there. And um, yeah, like if we want a secure signature scheme that is hybrid, then this is the way to do that. Uh, that also means that the, the concerns about separability are kind of non-concerns. Like this is completely fine, even though um, a key here uh, obviously would work in the, uh, as a downgrade attack for the first, first scheme by projecting. Uh, it wouldn't actually work because if we done the things correctly and the, the key describes um, the full function, then the key would say, well, I'm a hybrid key, and if you try to verify with it, um, it will say, well, there's half of the signature missing. Um, and in my opinion, that is uh, the better way of solving this issue rather than trying to do things like signing other signatures and so on. This, like, if we are uh, good about this, then uh, none of that should be uh, necessary, and I've not seen clear evidence that we get much out of trying to do uh, any other schemes about non-separability. Um, uh, the next point is uh, another point that is like kind of uh, uh, not quite related to this principle, but like a general good point of it would be nice to have less options rather than more um, if those options are not meaningful. Um, if I uh, uh, um, if, if I have to choose between a key size that will last until the sun swallows the earth or until the heat is of the universe, that is not a meaningful choice. Uh, what is a meaningful choice is like, I don't know, Delicium and Sphinx, uh, where they're both signature schemes, but one of them has a bigger attack surface where there could be more things that, that break it in the future, and so maybe I want to have something that is robust against uh, that kind of thing. Uh, that is something that I can reason about. Um, this is by, by no means the actual final list. Um, the standards aren't out yet, so I can't really say that. It's very possible that we go to the, to the 1024 thing just to be compatible with, uh, with the CNSA 2. Uh, but that is currently what we're, what we're implementing and, and experimenting with uh, using the 768, um, like the NIST level 3 in order to uh, uh, like be somewhat robust against some uh, regressions, but also assuming that uh, any kind of secure, secure scheme is secure because um, why, why would you give us this option otherwise? Uh, so I think that it's kinda, it would be kind of nice to have the options be meaningful for, for the people to work with uh, so that we can reason about what the differences are um, especially in a world where Moore's law has no longer applied for I don't know how long, uh, and key sizes haven't really moved since like the 2000s or so when um, the last thing, thing that you should really use RSA 2048 came out. Um, and as a last point, maybe 12 rounds of catch check would be nice, um, but I, I also would like a pony. Um, yeah, and so this is the, uh, uh, the takeaways. Uh, first of all, 
rolling out this stuff takes time. We need to start soon because it's really complicated. Um, next point, trying to like summarize a bit of what I ranted about on standards. Uh, there should be well-defined functions. There shouldn't be any edge cases that are implementation defined because that way lies vulnerabilities and all sorts of madness. And uh, as a last point, given that I'm addressing PQ Crypto here, it would be nice if we actually closed the gap a bit in this fancy cryptography section and like had similar flexibility and things to choose from um, that was safe against quantum computers. Okay, and with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and um, I think we are open for questions. Hi. Um, is there any reason why, so on your slide with um, these are the standards for us, is there any reason why Falcon is missing? Um, yeah, because I'm scared. <laughs> uh, mostly trying to implement Falcon in constant time seems to be an open research question and I would like to not have open research question in my production infrastructure. Okay. Um, I might have misunderstood you, so correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounded like you were saying you're against the idea for hybrid keys to have a, say, an elliptic curve key concatenated with a post-quantum key. Uh, no, I'm, I'm totally not against that uh, idea. That is, that is what we do currently for the, um, uh, um, for encryption. So it's a bit, uh, for asymmetric encryption, what you want to do is you want to have two shared secrets, you want to concatenate them and throw them in, into your favorite KDF. Um, for signatures, the thing that I'm against is um, having these keys to have meanings outside of, uh, their uh, outside of their hybrid nature. They should only ever exist as a, a classical key plus this, like this pl classical key plus this post-quantum key. Uh, they should never be the situation where this classical key that we use for years and will continue to be using, uh, and now we also add a post-quantum key um, uh, uh, to, and not rotate that, uh, that classical key with it. Like it should always be that if you have a classical key that is used in a hybrid scheme, that hybrid scheme should be the only place where it's used at. Uh, but no, I'm totally not against hybrid signatures. Um, I think hybrid signatures are the way to go, or hybrid anything is the way to go. Um, I, unfortunately lack the confidence that the NSA has in uh, structured lattices, so I will try to uh, um, like continue to be using uh, classic cryptography until um, we, these things are a little bit more battle tested. Uh, do we have any additional questions? No? Okay. Uh, then let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>